let's dive right in. How, how would you describe how closely mental health is when when looking at its connection to mass shootings, especially the two that we've already had in our state in 2021 and in uh, 2023? Um. Wow. It's almost like, well, duh. You know, I mean, you know, uh, sure. I, I mean, maybe it's simplistic and there may be somebody who could prove me wrong, but I've been involved in these on and off in my career and, and also talking about these last two. And they're clearly people who had longstanding emotional, you know, I, I don't, I can't diagnose anybody, but they're people who had long-standing emotional difficulties and disturbances. Mm -hmm. Would and you, I think could that's you... the key, is that they were long-standing and they're pretty blatant. Mm -hmm. Could you tilt your camera down if possible? You know, just that's what touch. I was just trying to do here. There we go. That's ah, okay. Perfect. That's I was trying to did, do that. Did you get a chance to look? And it's fine if you didn't. But, I did. Uh, Okay. I read the um I read the thing that you forwarded me um about the red flag law and what it would entail. Yeah, I mean what were your thoughts after reading that? Um my thoughts were that it would be very very helpful. Um and why you know and and it's not an automatic it's not that as soon as anyone has any concerns about someone, their guns are rescinded. So I don't think it could be used in a punitive or a vengeful way by a family member who had a grudge. I mean, there's a judge who makes the final determination. So a family member or a member of the community or a professional um, alerts the authorities that they have a concern but then ultimately the decision is made by authorities mm -hmm. so i think some people might say oh well you know in every domestic dispute this would come up but it's not about confiscating somebody's guns automatically because they have an argument with their spouse yeah so so how do you how do you think this change would go toward addressing some of the concerns for people or some of the the symptoms of uh of of you know the reasons for some of these mass shootings i mean a lot um, of it, it is rooted in in these mental health issues that um are usually addressed more on a reactive side rather than a proactive side well i use this metaphor a lot which is you know there's good news and there's bad news I mean, the good news is that those four kids in Oxford and those three kids in, at MSU probably would be alive today if somebody had activated a red flag, had, if somebody had pulled a flag on, on those individuals. But it doesn't address the larger mental health issue. I think it's I think the red flag law would um, protect society to to a significant extent because for a period of time those individuals would not have the means to commit these atrocities. Um, and if that's all we do, then unfortunately, you know, our society is still filled with people who have untreated mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, we then have to, the second step, of course, would be to provide some kind of appropriate mental, some kind of appropriate therapy for those individuals. But again, they have to be willing to do that. Mm -hmm. So then what, what would you say is the larger mental health issue and how, I guess you kind of just alluded to it, how would you like to see it addressed? Um, that's the big, that's the, that's the big question. Um, it's very, very hard um, to get people involved in mental health treatment who who don't want to. I mean, but on the other hand, we could make it more available. I think that after the pandemic, we saw that there's really a dearth of resources available for adolescents and young adults, that there aren't enough mental health 
providers and facilities to meet those needs. So through National Science Foundation, through National Institute of Health, we could institute more training programs for mental health professionals, especially targeted toward adolescents, children, and young adults. Mm. And we could provide okay. fellowships and training programs. And then the second thing is we have to figure out a mechanism so that that Medicaid or various insurance programs can cover the, the costs of people using those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and kind of like what we talked about yesterday, what I found really interesting is while, while these laws might be new to everyone else in the state of Michigan, someone in your position has been, uh, you know, the idea of alerting authorities and of someone who might cause harm to themselves or others, that's uh, really nothing new to people in your field, right? Mental, You've been in this health, mental health professionals all the way from counselors to social workers, to psychologists, to psychiatrists, um, and I don't, and probably physicians in general, um, have been mandated reporters. Um, and not just, you know, when we think of mandated reporting, we sometimes think about being legally responsible for notifying the authorities if there's child abuse or elder abuse. But it also pertains to if we think that an individual is at risk for harming themselves, or others, we need to notify appropriate authorities. This, however, also though, adds another dimension, which is that even when we notified the authorities, um, they did not have the legal, um, they, they couldn't legally remove the weapons from someone. They could keep an eye on them, they could put a restraining order, but until we have had red flag laws, it wasn't legal to take their weapons away from them. So really? this adds another dimension. Mm -hmm. Wow. Even in the case of the, spe the specific case you mentioned to me yesterday. Yep. Yes. Um, Tarasov, the, the name of the law was Tarasov, and then it got incorporated into the licensing across every state in the country. Um, and it's part of all of our licensing exams, and we all know about it. Um, in the mental health profession, but I am pretty sure that even when we report that we think someone's a danger to themselves or others, the police will make a wellness visit or or make some kind of a a safety check. But mm -hmm. I don't think that they have the authority to um, confiscate weapons. So what what ended up happening? I, I guess in, in the case again, the example that you gave me yesterday when you when you we're um, on the, the case that I gave you um, of a of a man who was very very angry at an ex and yeah. was describing these horrific things that he was going to do. I think what it turned out was that he there was nothing. He did not assault her. He didn't face to face threaten her. Um, I I guess he was letting off some steam and venting. Hmm. And there were no there were no. Um, uh no firearms maybe. there were no criminal repercussions oh okay gotcha gotcha and nobody nobody was injured okay well i guess that's yeah good for the, for that one example that's a good result yeah, obviously right. not always the case not always um, the case yeah uh so i'll end there's a one-to-one -one relationship i think between working backwards between active shooter instances and warning signs there is no, I, I would be willing to bet my anything that there are no active shooter instances where there were lots and lots and lots of warning signs. The reverse, however, is not true, is not true. And that's what makes, that's what makes it so difficult. Lots of people make threats. Lots of people exhibit warning signs who never act on them. So that's why when we balance people's civil rights and protecting the public, it's very tricky because of course, in retrospect, it seems like a no brainer, like, hello, why didn't we do something about this guy? He's been saying he was gonna do this. Mm -hmm. But of course, we're only saying that because there's blood on the ground. But before there was blood on the ground, we couldn't be sure that this wasn't just, you know, some angry guy blowing off steam. Mm -hmm. So we so can't lock the, everybody up who 
gets angry and everybody who gets angry who has a gun and even everybody who makes some kinds of threats and there has to be a kind of a degree of professional sophistication in that risk assessment process so that's interesting because like we talked about you know uh, the belief from a lot of republicans is that uh, these red flag laws might have a negative impact on people trying to get their mental health issues addressed uh, since it might hinder their chances of purchasing or possessing a firearm. Like you said, a, a lot of people who go through mental health episodes aren't necessarily going to always act on it, but that also means they might not ever, or at least because because it's only a one year order, so it's just temporary, okay. but they might uh -huh. not be able to own a gun for a year. And not saying that they would cause harm with that gun, but they can't even go out and go hunting to blow off steam if that was one of their mm -hmm. uh, things that, that helped with their mental health. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, when, when hearing that concern, what is your take on, on how this red flag law might impact people trying to get their mental health issues addressed? Well, I don't think that it automatically, even if the guns are confiscated, I don't know that they're automatically confiscated for a year. I think there may be an interim period. There's a six month check yeah. check in, okay. I guess. Okay. But it, and then if it's bad enough after that year, you can oh. ask for it, another petition. Right, but yeah, right. um, I would hope that before they issue this edict, they interview the family and they interview the individual and they interview their employer and they get a sort of a 360 degree panorama of what this person's life is like. Have they engaged in any violence before is there substance abuse um is there anything that's kind of a a precursor you know have they abused an animal um you know have they have they damaged property so i don't think we would automatically you know res withdraw someone's guns if there you know wasn't a pretty good if there wasn't a pretty good basis for it. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, the person where, you know, maybe they do have a substance abuse problem of some sort, maybe there is a domestic violence history, maybe there is damage of personal property, um, maybe they've been fired for getting into fights with their coworkers, mm -hmm. um, maybe the police have been called to the house for domestic violence. Um, then I think we have to act on behalf of the potential victims and you know it's unfortunate you know that someone feels as though their rights are being um curtailed but if there's a significant number of factors and i think that judges will probably you know once this goes into effect in michigan and i suspect judges in the other 21 states that have this have already done this they'll probably kind of have a checklist and if you have more than X number of checks, they'll they'll do it in the same way that when they're deciding custody, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's the it's always custody is always awarded on the best interests of the child. And sometimes that means one of the parents doesn't get exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. And that, that that is, you know, kind of like what you were just saying that if if a, a family member or a, a close friend were to approach a judge, uh, mm -hmm. requesting a petition that information alone would might not be enough to convince mm -hmm. a judge to issue the order but yeah they would have to scale it back and look at the full mm -hmm. scope mm -hmm. so yeah it's right in line with what you were saying yeah um is there anything else you wanted to mention this has been very very helpful i really appreciate it um well i, I really would like you know the people who who read about red flag laws and either the people who you know are chagrined because they think this is a, a failure or maybe what everyone can agree on both the side that feels vindicated in passing these laws and the side that feels stymied is that there's a tremendous need for better mental health care 